I don't like that all of the disciples abandoned Jesus. I don't like that. Verses 47 through 52 is where this is depicted. Judas's deed is done. With a kiss, he's betrayed Jesus into the hands of a mob sent from the religious elite, the scribes, the chief priests, the elders, Pharisees. In other words, Jesus' enemies. Judas plays a key role. I just want you to see this. Jerusalem is packed with people because they've all come there for the Passover. But keep in mind, this is nighttime, and they don't have handy flashlights. Everybody's got their little headlamps now. They don't have those things. If they want to find Jesus, he's going to be hard to find. It's crowded and it's dark. How can they find Jesus? Judas can help them. Judas can take them to the place where they know Jesus prays. And they go there with their torches to find him. But they need Judas. Judas plays a key role in handing Christ over. They came to get Jesus. The word Mark keeps using over and over again is seize. They came to seize him. That word, when they, they're coming to seize him, they're, they're not going to let him get away this time. You understand? They, they've been in their battles with Jesus before. All along through this gospel, chapters 1 through 14, we've seen these battles taking place. But this time they came to seize him. They got Judas working on their side. He's helping them out. When they come this time, they're they're coming to get him. They're not going to let Jesus go this time. They've got clubs with them. They've got swords with them. They expect resistance. They're coming to get him, and they're not going to let him go. This is a rough scene. I just try to imagine what it sounded like. You know, it's dark. There's torches, shadowy light, torches, There he is, you know, there goes Judas. He's going up to him, he kisses him. That's him, grabbing, shuffling people, swords coming out. Somebody cutting somebody's ear off. He's laying there probably crying, I would imagine, right? Screaming. This is a loud, noisy, troubling scene. Jesus does not resist. He seems very peaceful in this. He's even, somebody's just got their ear cut off. He just begins to address them. Have you come out against me like a robber? He's very peaceful. He's very determined. The disciples, not so. The disciples are dismantled, totally dismantled. They crumble, fall apart, and flee. Look at verse 50. This verse should flash like a red neon sign if we took all the lights out right now. This verse ought to flash. Boom! And they all left him and fled. Let me me contrast that with verse 31. Go over to verse 31. Verse 31 is the end of where Jesus is instructing them. He's telling them that I'm going to strike. The scripture says, verse 27, And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter's got something to say about that. Peter always has something to say about these things, doesn't he? We love Peter because we can relate to him. That's one of the things I love about Scripture. Scripture portrays people for who they really are, warts and all, all fallen, all in need of grace. And here's here's Peter. Peter says, even though the rest of these guys are going to fall away, I know them, Jesus, but you know me. I'm Peter. Yeah, I understand your question about these guys. But I, even if every single one of them abandons you, Jesus, I won't. Jesus. Jesus knows that you've got to appreciate the patience of Christ with us in our sin, don't you? <laughs> Truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Check out the end of the verse. And they all said the same. Verse 50, and they all left him and fled. We're talking hours, folks. They didn't cash that check, did they? (laughs) We're not talking like they said it a few months ago. They said hours ago at dinner. They all left him and fled. He's totally abandoned. The story of Mark, and I encourage you to read it, 
read the story of Mark. You can read the whole gospel of Mark in a sitting. But here's this whole story. Jesus has been pouring, pouring himself, pouring himself, instructing disciples, pouring into them. The whole story. Now we get to verse 14. I'm sorry, chapter 14, verse 50. They all left him and fled. And guess how many more times you're going to see something favorable said about the disciples? They don't even appear in the story except for one more embarrassing look at Peter and his denial. Jesus has been left alone with a pack of wolves, alone with no support from his friends, supported, surrounded, I'm sorry, by his enemies. I don't like this. I like to think of myself as acting differently. And then you look at verse 51 and 52. Some of you have to have questions about that. When I read about the naked man, you know some of you were holding back laughter right there when I was reading God's word. I mean, what's up with that? I don't know. Some scholars think that Mark, the writer of this gospel, actually inserted himself right here. It's like a cameo. That he's the young man following Christ from a distance who is seized and flees naked. We don't know. I don't know. I love the idea, though. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like if the, if the Gospel of Mark were made into a movie. You got Mark, the Gospel of Mark. He's the writer. He doesn't appear in any of it. He's not a character in the whole story. He's writing Peter's Gospel. He's just been listening to Peter. Now he's writing it down. But as the credits roll, you know, Jesus played Peter. Streaker. <laughs> Mark. So why put verses 51 and 52 here? I'll tell you, here's the effect. Verse 50, and they all left him and fled. Even someone, I just want to let you know how complete the abandonment was. This is how complete the abandonment was. All of the disciples left him and fled. And even this other supporter, he's following a distance with nothing really on. He's got some kind of, what's he got, a linen cloth about his body. He's, he's a, a would-be supporter. Every would-be supporter has abandoned Jesus, even if it means you've got to run away with no clothes on. That's how completely he's been abandoned. That's how alone Jesus is. Jesus will make his way to the cross completely and utterly forsaken, alone. This is that, as he said, the scriptures might be fulfilled. The shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus will not be assisted by anyone on the road to the cross. He will not be assisted by anyone in securing the salvation of sinners. No one will make a contribution of assistance. Jesus will face his enemies alone. He will be rejected and suffer alone. He will be mocked and spit upon alone. He will be beaten beyond recognition alone. He will carry his cross alone. He will be nailed to that cross alone. Even God the Father. Forsaken. Jesus will go it alone. So now I'd like to think that if I was one of the 12, I'd contribute in some way. You know, when I'm reading this as story and I get to verse 47, that's the only part where I want to stand up and cheer. That one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. That's the part of the movie where I get excited. I'm looking at Jim Donahue because I, I know he feels the same way. That's, that's the part. Yes! We know. No, but we don't know who, who did that except for John tells us it was actually Peter. Here's Peter trying to make good. Peter's trying to make good on his claim. I'll never abandon you. The rest of these guys might. I won't. Sword out. You got to fight. I'll, 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 I'll take somebody's ear off. And I want to cheer there. Yes! Peter, fight! Stop this from happening, Peter. Stop it. Stop it. Fight, Peter. Don't just take his ear off. Take his head off, Peter. Stop what? Stop what? Stop the scriptures from being fulfilled, Peter? Stop God's plan for saving sinners from unfolding? Stop Jesus from going to the cross. 
This is how Jesus has been telling them time and time again that it's going to go down. Rejection, suffering, death, and resurrection. It's God's plan for saving sinners. This is why Mark wrote the gospel. All of God's saving activity is found in Christ alone. And this is how he'll save us. By standing in the place of sinners, suffering what we deserve to suffer in our place alone. Things I don't like about the cross of Christ are the very things I need. I need Christ alone on that cross. You need him alone on that cross. Now, we have a problem with this because we never want to be given anything for free. We, have, we struggle with grace. It's deep in, it's deep in our heart to con, want to contribute something to our salvation. A lot of people, when they think about Christianity, they immediately think about what we must do. It's true about all world religions. You examine any of them. It's all about what you must do to merit. Christianity, not so. But we do this. We develop a moral improvement plan. You might not call it that, but we all operate with it. Got to do some good. Got to merit this. At least in some way. Christianity actually teaches the opposite of a moral improvement plan for salvation. Complete opposite. In Christian understanding, Christ does not tell us through this whole gospel, he's been instructing the disciples and ultimately us, he doesn't tell us how to live so that we can merit salvation. Instead, Christ comes to forgive us and save us through his life and death alone. God's grace doesn't come to those who morally outperform others. It to, comes to those who admit their failure to perform, to acknowledge their need for him, who will trust in Christ's performance alone. 